Okay, so today we have a speaker um, that we are all familiar with, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Chris Chipotle. Uh, Dr. Chipotle has been working with us uh, for so many years. Um, and his career starts uh, back, scientific career started back in the 90s. Uh, he did his uh, PhD uh, uh, in the early 90s, actually. Uh, the PhD was in uh, University of uh, Hen Henry uh, oh, Hen Hen uh -huh. oh, yeah, okay. in France. Uh, so he won a, a PhD degree in consultant in theoretical chemistry, 1994. And then uh, he moved to the uh, United States, uh, did uh, a few uh, short-term postdocs in UCSF and the NASA you know, Amundsen Center, and then uh, moved back to France, started in 1996 in CNRS. And uh, during the time in, uh, in CNRS, he has won uh, several, uh, many uh, different scientific awards, uh, just to name a few. Uh, 1999 uh, Young Scientist Award of French Chemical Society, and uh, uh, 2001 uh, CNRS Bronze Medal. Um, and then uh, he uh, also uh, gradually uh, uh, moved up the rank. Uh, in year 2000, he got the uh, habitation. And then 2006 became a uh, research director. And uh, and also he has many uh, collaboration and uh, affiliation in different universities, including here, also in universities in China, in Chile, and uh, also U Chicago. Mm -hmm. And one C particularly uh, over here relevant to us, he got the senior fellowship in uh, the Beckman Foundation back in uh, 2014. So yeah, uh, and you you guys probably all know his name from uh, 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 free energy calculation methods. Uh, we have VND tutorial, uh, NMD tutorial in uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, adapted uh, course, uh, biosing course, and uh, uh, more advanced uh, free energy perturbation methods. So yeah, today uh, he's going to talk about the uh, free energy calculation methods in uh, uh, exascale computing era. Thank you so much. Um, first, I'd like to thank you all for the invitation. It's always great to be back here. Um, so yeah, this is what I do. I do free energy calculation. But you realize that's that's the best thing I can talk about. It's uh, energy methods. So let me let me start with uh, some perspective. I mean, why do we do energy calculation? What's the motivation? And this guy here, uh, you may not know, is Bernie Alder, actually the the one who uh, first used the dynamic simulation back in 1927. And rapidly, uh, when people started to do this simulation, which were brand new and with very limited computation power, realized that uh, they were dealing with very rugged French humanity. And, uh, and the interesting transition between two uh, large volumes of configurational space was not that easy. And uh, about 10 years after the seminal pioneering work of Bernie Alder, uh, the first who actually started to think about free energy calculations as a tool to uh, basically address non ergodicity or the impression that uh, because of your running sh short simulations, you uh, your simulation is actually highly dependent on the initial condition because you're not sampling the full configurational space. People like uh, Jan McDonald started to, uh, to be uh, the first 
attempts to uh, to uh, compute the free energy between um, states in the production space. Of course, ever since then, a lot of methods have been devised, and um, here's just an excerpt of the uh, the best theory of uh, of methods that are available just for collective variable based fringe calculation. I mean, of course, other types of fringe calculations we mentioned FEP calculations, which are not collective variable based, but here's essentially uh, what you can find in uh, most uh, MD uh, workforces. So I've classified that my classification um, may be arguable and, uh, and I accept that, but uh, I've classified them uh, as uh, histogram based methods, kind of global methods where we're trying to get some probability distribution. That includes the uh, famous umbrella sampling from uh, John Mugalo back in 1977. So it's not quite recent. Mm -hmm. 57, first attempt to simulation, 67, first attempt to get a free energy, 77 umbrella sampling. Mm -hmm. And all the way to uh, metadynamics from the uh, Parinello group, although one would argue that the seminal ideas are earlier on Van Ginster and, and, uh, and Helen Kopula. A completely different class of method, uh, gradient based methods. Uh, so the idea here is to get free energy derivatives, then integrate it to get free energy. And finally, here in the corner, uh, they're not that used. I mean, they were used at some point, but people realized that these methods are actually expensive and, uh, and you can get the same result much cheaper. It was other methods based on non equilibrium work utilizations like. Uh, to steer MD calculations, you repeat it many times, and we all apply Johnson's identity or Crookes identity, which is like uh, combining forward and reverse simulation, actually gets in equilibrium. All of these methods, actually, I mean, they have many names, and it can be confusing for the uh, layman. Uh, uh, they kind of rely on very simple ideas. That, uh, which I've summarized here. So umbrella sampling is essentially uh, including some uh, uh, restraining potentials and, and, and trying to get uh, the uh, probability distribution of visiting different uh, region of configuration space, which we have discretized uh, along the, uh, the collective model. This is the basic idea of uh, metadynamics, essentially applying or introducing uh, Gaussians to flood valleys, so that in the end uh, uh, you kind of sample a flat finish answer. That's the very basic idea of all these methods. When you apply this uh, potential, when you add these Gaussians, or when you do uh, adaptive biasing force by calculating the gradients and uh and estimating uh at every time step the gradient and applying an average force not to flood the valley but this time to crush the free energy landscape in the end your objective is the same you want to make all the rugosity all the ruggedness of the free energy landscape to appear so that you diffuse freely on a flat free energy landscape okay. and then another Interesting thing of, uh, of, of free energy method is that you can combine them seamlessly. So you have this important sampling algorithm, and you can combine it. So you can, for instance, combine uh, adaptive biasing force with metadynamics. And so you're flooding the valley at the same time as you're crushing the mountains. You can also add an extra step. You can also add, uh, as you do in accelerated MD or Gaussian accelerated MD. You can add boosting potential to even go further, uh, uh, to, to accelerate further your, your, your sample. Then you can do parallel tempering, so do your uh, ABF simulation or your umbrella sampling simulation, and do that at different temperatures and exchange temperatures to make the low uh, temperature energy regions, or sorry, sorry, the high temperature energy region available, or the configurations available to the low temperature. 
And then you have all this uh, collection of uh, methods that uh, rely on multiple copy algorithms, which we have in that if you can do multiple copy ABF, we call that multiple walkers. Uh, you can do multiple walker dynamics. You can combine the two you have multiple walker meta dynamics at ABM. Um, ABF is definitely uh, the method I'm kind of associated with, although uh, the guy who actually uh, thought about it first is uh, M4 really here, which was actually my postdoc advisor. NASA, it relies on a very simple idea. Uh, it relies on this definition that the gradient of the free energy is equal to the expected value of the force that is measured along the reaction core. So what you do with APF is you're sampling first to the low energy region, the Boltzmann sampling, and uh, along this reaction point, data can be discretized in small bits. And so you measure the local force that is acting along this reaction point. And, and you store the value of the force that you mentioned. At some stage, when you have accrued a user defined number of force samples, you will calculate the average, the expected value of the force, which is equal to the gradient. And, and, and so that will result in eliminating the, bar the barrier that is seen by the water, okay. resulting in a quasi flat distribution of samples along, um, along the reaction volume. As you can see here, it's progressively filling all the bins. And in the end, that's kind of a sign of convergence. Uh, you have a flat uh, distribution of flat energy. There are other definitions. Uh, this is one definition that is used in coal bars for depending on the uh, collective variable that you're using. Uh, you may want to use this definition or that definition. That definition rests on the calculation of a uh, vector field, which can be used, for, for instance, if you if you want to calculate the free energy uh, with respect to a vector field that comes, for instance, from uh, PCA, uh, uh, principal component analysis, or just the dihedral. The dihedral can be seen as a vector field, very simple vector field, but a vector field, vector field nonetheless. It comes in different flavors. I mean, since the, uh, the uh, first paper that we the first implementation of ABF that we did in 2004, so almost 20 years ago, in its very simple form, uh, it has uh, undergone a number of improvements and extensions like GABF. GABF is a way, a nice way to access multimodal or um, multi dimensional energy landscapes based on one-dimensional calculations. So you do one, many one-dimensional calculations at the same time, and you reconstruct the uh, complete free energy lens. Um, EABF is actually what we use the most now. It used to be the Pullman ABF. And we call it the Pullman ABF because uh, it doesn't need an ingredient important in classical ABF, which is the J coupling, uh, so the derivative of the, of the reaction um, EABF is actually an extended Lagrangian version of ABF. So basically, what you're tracking is not anymore the reaction coordinate model, the collective variable. You are tracking a fictitious particle that is attached by a stiff spring to the reaction coordinate. And so, of course, when you want to get the actual free energy, you need to deconvolute the contribution of the stiff spring and the uh, British spot. So you get this uh, uh, probability distribution, and you need to account for, so that's the gradient, you need to account for the contribution of the stiff spring and the British spot. Then you can, oh, so then you have PABF, which is the projected 
version of ABM. For a long time, when you were doing multidimensional uh, free energy calculation with ABM, you were, only, you were only getting the gradient. And you had to use an external code to integrate the gradient with uh, some kind of Monte Carlo, like a multidimensional integration. Now, in PADF, um, you exploit uh, the, the Helmholtz decomposition, which says that you can express a vector field as a scalar and a curl term. And, um, and when you do the integration, when you actually we, we solve that as a kind of a Poisson equation, uh, we uh, get rid of the curl term. So resulting in less noise in the final frame. Then you can combine GABF with EABF, that's EGABF, which is uh, uh, shown up here. I'm not going to go into the detail of this application, but it's so pretty efficient. Curl is done in which space? Curl, for the, in, in 2D. I mean, the, what you had before, you, what, you had uh, the decomposition of the vector field, which was in red in terms of a scalar part and a rotational part. And we get rid of the rotational part when uh, when we do in actual physical coordinates. Yeah, yeah. Um, then we can combine this important sampling algorithm with some ergodic sampling um, method. So, for instance, we can use multiple copies of that small water in the Again, have different waters uh, populating the free energy landscape. Measuring each the gradient that we see and exchanging information about the gradient every so often. That's user one. And the hope, of course, is that when you have like orthogonal barriers in uh, or hidden barriers in orthogonal space, which usually results in uh, incomplete sampling, you hope that you will you will populate different values that are separated these barriers so that in the end uh, you can get a, a reasonable sampling of each value otherwise impossible with a single block and we have meta here combines meta dynamics and the adaptive bicycle force uh, method and which has proven to be way more effective than either meta dynamics or ADF and but suffers from the same symptoms as in the dynamics, which is absence of convergence, because you keep adding Gaussians to your free energy landscape. And so you get, I think, the end oscillations. You never converge towards the actual free energy. But that has been solved by the parental group afterwards, kind of a patch on the dynamics. This is called well tempered meta whereby the size of the Gaussians diminishes. As you get closer to convergence, and and then another way to um, um, to add non-ergodicity or to to fight non-ergodicity is to uh, include other methods than classical MD to sample configuration of space. So in this case. We use non equilibrium switches. So we do MD and every swap and we put non equilibrium switch and then we turn to accelerated MD. And then we do a metropolis Hastings criterion to decide whether we accept this pass or reject it. And then we measure the force with it. You can also do that using reweighting. And this is the, the last, uh, the newborn of the family of, uh, of ABF. This is Gaussian accelerated, well-tempered metal ABF. So uh, I mentioned meta uh, EABF. So this is uh, how you could uh, uh, write the, uh, the, the potential. So you have like potential for force yield, you have the extended particle and you have the biasing. Uh, term which comes from uh, the Gaussians that you add to your French density plus the uh, the bias from ABF. And uh, this methodology uh, 
has proven to accelerate uh, sampling by a factor of five to six with respect to classical. That's pretty, uh, pretty substantial. We have like a definitely a class of convergence and voices in a problem like uh, permeation, which is like multi microsecond uh, calculation. Uh, we get the result about four to five times faster than we used to with uh, with classical ADF. And icing on the cake uh, with classical ADF, we had to uh, decompose the uh, reaction pathway into non overlapping windows, usually using nine to 10 windows. With meta EDF, we can do that in three windows. And so, yeah, so that's the last. Uh, uh, the last the newborn of the family. So we add, in addition to uh, uh, the biases from uh, uh, metadynamics and uh, ABF, we add this boosting potential uh, from Gaussian accelerated MD. And so uh, this is how we uh, unbiased and, uh, and get the actual uh, free energy. So we start um, unbiasing the uh, probability distribution, bias probability distribution. Uh, from ABF and the metadynamics, and then we do some reweighting to get the, uh, the actual uh, the actual fluidity. Reweighting from the uh, 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 probability distribution biased by the by the boost potential. And so, in this case, we get we gain up to ten a factor of ten with respect to classical. So we've applied that to a variety of systems, including. Uh, uh, sampling uh, the configuration space for short peptides is signaling and, and compared to uh, what well, under assembly, for instance, here uh, doesn't even give you the correct uh, basins of the uh, 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 configuration space, confirmation space in this case. Uh, uh, well tempered meta media gives it, but uh, you have to wait quite a bit of time. And uh, and those next well the you can do that gets you pretty quickly in a matter of a microsecond if it gets you the uh, correct distribution and and the correct population of the different uh, of the different states would be uh, the COVID state, the intermediate state, the second state. But now, uh, now that we have the, the machinery. Uh, we are back to uh, the question of getting the correct variable, the correct model of the reaction code. And I absolutely like this quote from, this is by the way, Bob Svensik. This is what he said, statistical mechanics does not tell us what the relevant variables are, but it's our choice. If we choose well, the result will be useful. If we choose badly, the result might still form correct, will probably be useless. And I want to draw to your attention one of the tenets of uh, computational chemistry and the way we've been taught about French calculations that they don't depend on the path that we choose. If we're interested in the fringe difference between state A and state B. It doesn't matter which path we choose because fringe is a state function. So in the end, we should get the correct answer. This is not quite <laughs> completely true. You will get eventually if you sample at infinitum, but we don't have like infinite sampling. And some paths are more uh, judicious than others. And on top of that, we may be interested also in a physically uh, meaningful path. And I you know that in, in work. Confirmation transitions in, uh, in, in transporters where the path is important, choosing the correct path, the path that will reflect the correct dynamics. And for that, uh, the, choice, the choice of the, uh, the reaction point model is, uh, is important. So we want, we want to find reaction coordinate that include all the important metastatic uh, on our agenda and the transition states between them and capture the slow degrees of freedom. And so, how can we find this uh, collective variables? Um, oftentimes, they are from chemical and physical intuition. And what I want to talk a little bit today is uh, how we can get them from machine learning. 
Let me give you an example of intuition and how bad our intuition can be. The problem here is the passage of a small molecule across a membrane. This is typically what you would do if you were interested in calculating membrane vulnerabilities to uh, drugs. Well, what we commonly use to get the membrane permeability to a drug is a model that is called the inhomogeneous solubility diffusion model, which takes two ingredients, the potential of mean force for translocating the drug across the membrane, and that's an exponential drug. And it's divided by the diffusivity. So the diffusivity, there are many ways to get the diffusivity. One way that we use uh, is based on Bayesian influence. We get from our ABS simulation, we get a trajectory, and from this trajectory, we get the diffusivity by essentially solving the Smolikovsky equation. And what we see here, so basically we discretize motion, we have our trajectory, we discretize motion, and we use a Brownian approximation for this discretization of motion. Essentially, we assume Markovian behavior. In other words, said differently, we assume that the probability distribution from for going from Z1 at, T, uh, at time T1 to Z2 at time T2 in Gaussian distribution. But what we see when we get the diffusivity and we plot this diffusivity for different black times, we see that we have no consensus. While we are, were expecting that within a certain range of black time, we should get the same diffusivity. We are in fact are all over the map, which is a landmark, which is a hallmark of uh, anomalous diffusivity. And the reason why we have this anomalous diffusivity is because of vision of what should be the reaction coordinate. And in this case, what we use is something very simple, something that our intuition told us. The projection of the Euclidean distance between the center of mass of the drug to the center of mass of the, of the, of the membrane mm -hmm. onto the Z axis. That makes sense. But that's certainly not the slowest mode uh, of the problem. So we're not capturing all the slow modes that are at play. And these slow modes that are connected to the very slow relaxation of the acyl chain of the membrane. And in fact, what you see here, maybe it's a little bit difficult to see, what we are highlighting here in purple are the formation of voids. So as the acyl chains are dancing around, they are opening voids. And we, the reason why we have this behavior is in fact, we, we don't have a Markovian behavior. We have a superimposition of two regimes. A regime whereby the small molecule is waiting for a long time jiggling around. And a regime when it enters a void and diffuses very quickly within the void to another place, which you can call a levy flight, if you will. And in fact, when you look at the distribution of the probability to go from Z1 T at T1 to Z2 at T2, you can see a cusp and very long tail, which kind of reflects the very long wait of the drug uh, waiting for a void to open and be able to diffuse within this model. We can solve this problem from a different perspective using uh, what we call the fractional version of the Smolikovsky equation, which is embodied here in this uh, equation. Everything falls into place. But the point that I want to make is that incompleteness of the reaction coordinate model that we have here is this very simple Euclidean distance mm -hmm. tells us that if we're not using the correct collective variable, we're missing a lot and we cannot capture the correct dynamics. The problem. 
Is this an equilibrium simulation or an yeah. AF it's equilibrium? Uh, completely equilibrium. <laughs> so the questions are assuming that we have candidate collective bar, can we construct better CDs? The existing one, and is it possible to start on biased energy trajectory as opposed to equilibrium? And for that, we're going to use auto encoders and, 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 and see actually, I've already, you know, there are spoilers here, uh, see how we can address the possible limitation of these auto encoders. And uh, one of the options is to use timeline what we call to introduce uh, the notion of time, notion of temporality in, uh, in, in, in the way we're going to encode the, um, uh, the collective variable and possibly dampness. So the dampness are this uh, variational uh, yeah. approach for uh, Markov uh, process networks. And uh, how we can apply time series based neural network on uh, bias trajectories. So this is not new. I mean, there are other people who have worked on that and I want to cite three of uh, three groups. I mean, uh, uh, Mesa, uh, kind of a pioneer in the field is uh, Andrew Ferguson at Pritzker School, uh, University of Chicago. Um, uh, they use actually they use equilibrium trajectory and uh, and they use auto encoders to discover CDs and then they uh, uh, deposits uh, on these CDs the deposits uh, some restraining potential into umbrella temporal. David actually comes from the group of Tony Rulier, uh, whom some of you would know. Uh, collaborated with uh, with us with uh, Klaus. Uh, and, um, and again, they use equilibrium trajectory, they use auto encoder, and, um, and then they do enhanced sampling. They use actually uh, ABF um, to do their uh, enhanced sampling uh, and get their uh, potential mean force. And uh, there's also the approach of uh, Pratush Tiwari, who some of you, uh, uh, some of you uh, already know. And uh, it's essentially the same, uh, the, the, the same spirit uh, of, of combining uh, uh, neural networks to get uh, collective variables and, and plot uh, collective variables in, uh, in uh, uh, enhanced sampling uh, approach. So why is the classical autoencoder not always suited? So, here is a problem of a uh, very simple potential here that's, uh, uh, that you have here and uh, that has like three wells. And uh, so we're doing equilibrium MD and, um, and what the autoencoder predicts uh, is that the slow variable, actually uh, the highest variance variable, is uh, x, and this is the this is uh, of course where the barrier is. So you expect indeed uh, x to be uh, the slow value. And it turns out that uh, it's also uh, the highest variance. And, I, and actually, I want to impress upon you that one should not always conflate slow variable and high variance variable. Um, so here in this particular case, if we look at the variance uh, along uh, for the time series along X and for the time series along Y, it's pretty clear that X is the high variance variable. And it's also the slow variable. Now let's modify, um, let's modify the potential and uh, playing with uh, this uh, 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 parameter here, alpha, and increase it to 10. So now we have uh, a variance of 0.78 uh, along X and 0.99 along Y. And we can see that now the autoencoder, the classical autoencoder is confused and thinks that the slow variable is Y, when in fact it's still X. The barrier is still in the X direction. 
which an autoencoder with a timeline is able to detect, is able to identify. Now, what about bias trajectories? So now instead of using classical MD, we are biasing with uh, well tempered beta EPM. And the important thing here is uh, the loss function. So the loss function is essentially when you use an autoencoder, the loss function is uh, tells you what you lost in the process. Are, are you all familiar with autoencoders or not at all? You're all familiar. So the idea of an autoencoder is you supply the trajectory, which you will usually featureize. Or featureization means like you can say, okay, this trajectory, I want to calculate distances, I want to calculate that people, yeah. and so on. And then you have a series of layers, we call them hidden layers, where we'll, you will combine all this information with impacting of different functions that are usually non linear, like really like uh, hyperbolic tangents. And the idea of the autoencoder is to uh, end up to, to do a dimensionality reduction Oops. and number of collective variables that we use every time. In this case, we are after uh, a single variable, uh, which we project afterwards for visualization purposes in the XY, uh, uh, in the XY plane. But we are after a single CV that will describe the whole thing. And then you have like the mirror image. So that was the encoding part. Then you have the mirror image of the decoding part. And you will compare the outputs that you have obtained from your single variable mm -hmm. with the inputs of your encoder. I like to. Forgive me for this uh, this analogy, but I kind of like to use it nonetheless. It's like I, I know that in the US, people are fond of frozen concentrated orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it, for me, it's a kind of a, it defies uh, uh, the purpose. Defies the purpose, <laughs> yes. So you have like in Florida, they have like these oranges, and they squeeze them, they make like this very nice orange juice. Uh, which sometimes they sell as Tropicana or, and, uh, but some of it is frozen, concentrated and frozen. That would be the latent space of your uh, autoencoder, mm -hmm. like the one dimensional CV. Mm -hmm. And then I buy this frozen concentrated orange juice and I add water and that would be my decoder. Yeah. And then I compare the glass of, Orange juice coming from the food and concentrated orange juice with the one that was squeezed in Florida. <laughs> and if they don't taste the same, that would be my loss. Mm -hmm. That would be my loss function. But when you use bias MB, um, then you have to take into account the biases that you have introduced and, 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 and the weights for these different biases. You need to take into account the weights of the configurations that you generated from this bias ensemble. And so here again, if you use a regular loss without taking into account this weights and these biases, again, the autoencoder is confused. It's only when you have a proper description of the weights and the biases that you can recover. And here again, we have X as the uh, slow mode or the slow variable uh, for this process. So how we how do we put all these ingredients together? So we want to do an iterative learning with bias trajectories, and and this is pretty much the egg or chicken dilemma. We need a good trajectory to learn CVs, but at the same time we need an ensemble along some CV to generate a good trajectory, right? So what we do is actually we. We, we tried a number of strategies and, uh, and we came with, uh, uh, for us, the best 
the best autoencoder is actually what we call a Siamese uh, neural network uh, that takes into account a trajectory uh, at time t and at time t plus delta t for the Siamese model, time t plus slow. And so the idea is we start with a bias in this simulation with some human intuition for the collective body. And we feed that to the autoencoder. And the autoencoder will for the Siamese encoder or the Siamese neural network. It will spit out a refinement of our human intuition, which we will plug into our uh, MD code or followers. And we will generate more sampling with this first iteration, this refined seeding. And we will feed it back to the Siamese neural network and so on and so forth until we make no progress. So then your initial trajectory is actually biased. It's biased, yes. Okay, so you no longer a And we found that it's way more efficient right. than uh, just the equilibrium. And we will not be able to visit it yeah. in basic. Right, right. I see. So all of this is available <laughs> in Colgars, thanks to the uh, heroic efforts of uh, Hao Chuan. So uh, you notice here that uh, you have uh, uh, these extra keywords, uh, neural network, where you actually define the weights, where you define the biases, where you define the activation function, uh, making use of the lepton library of the Eastman. Uh, uh, and then you have the custom call bars that, uh, that could be part of uh, the definition of your learn C scholars. Here's an example uh, of uh, I know it's in vanilla. It has nothing to do with a transport. <laughs> but you know, in the words of the people the, uh, in, uh, in the, the TV show Westworld. But not quite there yet. <laughs> um, so it didn't quite work with the uh, with the time lag also encoder, but it worked pretty well with the uh, with the uh, stage three um, reversible dampness. I mean, replay that should be. Uh, so could I interrupt quickly? Yeah. What what is what are the features that you feed your other encoder? In this particular case, we fed uh, all the data. Just the dihedral. Yes. And uh, no, this is what we feed to the uh, to the uh, to the autoencoder. And we featureize this the sine and cosines of this dihedral of all the dihedrals, yes, including including the, uh, the omega angles. And of course, if the autoencoder is smart enough, it will discard. The omega because So why did you think the sine and cosine are the features of this peptide? It just helps better with the uh, uh, to have more things to go into there. No, and also the uh, uh, for the uh, the, the periodicity uh, with all that exactly it, it does help with the sine and cosine right. as opposed to the angles. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So I'm going to replay that, um, that that movie here. So this is what you call the ground truth. And, um, and this is an old calculation that I did a few years ago uh, of a string method. So for those who are not familiar with the string method, this one is familiar with this string method. Was wrong. You're all familiar with the string method was wrong trajectory. So this is the, 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 uh, the optimized string. So going from C7 equatorial to C7 axial, uh, this is C5 is better uh, uh, in, in the gas phase, there is no alpha. Uh, so this is one path. We know from David Chandler, Peter Goldweiss, that there are actually other paths. Uh, this is one path, another path would be going down here, reappearing here, going down here, and reappearing here. And going down there, visiting both C5 and C7 equatorial. This is exactly what we have here. So the learned collective variable here, uh, and it was like a one parameter that we use again, not a, a latent space of dimension one, mm -hmm. but projected onto five side. 
we learn how to go from here to here, not through here, but through here, and visiting C5. Here, you have no idea what C5 is. And in fact, if you calculate the free energy along this string, this optimized string, this is what you have here. Uh, it doesn't go through C5 because it doesn't. There's no C5, right? So this is C7 equatorial, C7 axial, and numerically, you have 2.4 gigawatt. Incidentally, for those who are interested in this, we're using the so called PCB, past collected variable, which are encoded in, uh, in cold bars, uh, which really follow the string. We follow the string. So it's usually done in three dimensions. Uh, one is the actual position along the string, and one represents the radius of a tube that embraces it. So you can actually depart a little bit from the string. And usually you get a two dimensional fringe profile and you take the marginal distribution to obtain the, uh, the, 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 the PML in uh, along the street along this. And so from this, uh, actually from this uh, discovery of the, uh, uh, of, of the one dimension CV, we get also uh, the, uh, the one dimension PMF. And uh, lo and behold, we, we, we get something that is consistent with, uh, with this completely different type of calculation we get to. So we are, we're able, but the autoencoder for the Siamese uh, neural network is able to discover the three states, you can call it C5, an axial, is also able to give you a faithful uh, quantitative image of the fringe genes. A little bit more difficult uh, was the case of Fried Alanin. Uh, we worked on that with Emma uh, for two years, uh, crawling through glass naked for two years, right? yeah. sweating blood, uh, trying to understand. Right? We thought I mean, that so we understood the string that the strong to choose it. In fact, we uh, overlooked a number of important details. A lot of people conflated the idea of calculating a string with getting the minimum free energy uh, pathway, which couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, in fact, you get, as we will see in the next slide, you get a variety of pathways. And only one is physically many. So here, uh, we're working in a latent space of dimension three, feeding all the dihedrals again uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, Siamese uh, neural network, this is what we obtain in that particular space. Why a latent space of three? That's the only space we tried two, we tried one. That's the only space that is able to uh, separate the multiple minima of the uh, free energy elements. Otherwise, they all coalesce together. It's impossible to distinguish which one is which one. And so what you see, this or oh, this is the projection of this in the phi one, phi two, phi three space. And what I showed here comes from the work that we published earlier this year with Emma of the optimization of the string, one possible optimization of the string in uh, the phi one, phi two, phi three space. And you can see that you go from A to B uh, through M1, M3, uh, and uh, this is exactly what we find here during a past search. Once we have recovered the uh, three dimensional uh, energy map, and when we calculate uh, the uh, potential of mean force, so this is the uh, unsmooth, this is uh, sorry, um, I forgot uh, which one, which one, but the, the one that you should compare is the green one and the uh, red one. The red one comes from this calculation, this stream calculation, with the PCB calculation along the, uh, the, the, along the optimized stream. And uh, the green one is the one that is obtained from the uh, science neural network. The comment that I was making about not quite understanding what the string is about is if you actually introduce randomization 
in uh, 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 randomization, multiple copies in your string optimization, well, you don't find just one path, you find many paths. And these different paths have different meanings. And in fact, when you calculate so you, for, for, for this different path, you need to calculate the potential mean force using the diffusivity approach that I mentioned before by Asian inference. You get so the diffusivity, if you have diffusivity, if you have the potential mean force, you can calculate the mean force passage time. And the path that corresponds to the lowest minimum, uh, the lowest mean first passage time or the highest rate constant, which can be first of the mean of the passage time, correspond actually to the most probable transition pathway, the one that has, that is physically meaningful in terms of getting the correct dynamics. Um, one question that you might want to ask is, is the learned CV the committer? So for those who are not familiar with the committer, the committer or committing probability, probability starting from a given point to reach the end state B before crossing state A. Which you can think in terms of uh, a scalar function, uh, uh, Q of Z equals zero if you want A, Q of Z equals one if you want B. And so this is the famous Müller Grand uh, potential. And so we sample that. And, um, and we are able to capture the slowest eigenvector. Uh, if you think in terms of transition operator, that would be like the second eigenvector associated to the transition. So we go from this space into this space. And we get something in 1D, so this parameter S, we get something that looks like a commuter or here. But it's not quite a committer. The committer goes from zero to one, uh, whereas the slowest eigenvector goes from minus one to plus one. And we apply that also to the uh, Berezovsky uh, saddle potential, which, uh, which is kind of nice because uh, in, in this potential, you can play with the diffusivity in X and Y. So we consider uh, 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 three cases where you diffuse 10 times faster in X, equally in X and Y, and 10 times faster in Y. And so in principle, this should be reflected in, uh, in the learned CD and in something that resembles the committer. And in fact, just published that with, uh, with Benoit, uh, uh, this is an approach called the uh, little consistent variation. It's a way to calculate the committer based on the on the string method uh, in a following a variational principle. And you can see here that the committer of this is in white. This is the so-called isocommitment circuits. You can see that it changes depending upon or even the string in, uh, in red. It changes depending upon if you choose faster in X or in Y or equally in X and Y. And what we what we learn here is that uh, you definitely need to uh, uh, introduce the time lag and uh, and the weights, the correct weights and the correct biases in the description to get something that is akin to a real committer calculation. So let me. Uh, conclude because I uh, gone over time. So, data driven CV discovery, as I presented uh, today, can supply a natural reaction coordinate model, which is uh, A, a dimensionality reduction, B, learn from the dynamics, and C, is maximally predictive of future evolution. We have seen that classical autoencoders can capture high variance modes instead of slow modes. So that's important. A shortcoming that can be nonetheless overcome using uh, with time series based models, such as uh, time lag autoencoders, modified time lag autoencoders, and state free reversible campus. Still, in a variety of non linear cases, 
the time lag between coders still encode a mixture of high variance and slow modes, not quite able to distinguish the modes that decorrelate the slowest. Um, time series based models still lean on reasonable choices. So don't get fooled by people telling you, oh, this is a black box, you can just put your protein, your favorite protein, and you'll tell you everything about it. So there are many uh, steps along the way where human intervention is important. The lag time, the number of layers uh, of hidden layers in your autoencoder or your silent neural network, the number of neurons, the activation function, the choice whether you're gonna whiten your input or not whiten your input. Are you gonna do data regularization or not data regularization? Introduction of randomization, if you want, in your in, in, in the process. There are all these little, how long should be your trajectory? Mm -hmm. How big should be your lifetime? Uh, how often should you store? Uh, should you dump your product? Mm -hmm. And finally, the deep connection between the discovered series and the computer consistent variation strength suggests that this methodology might be suitable, might be we could extend it to actually model instead of the CV, model a scalar function to get us the commitment, at least for a two state problem. And with that, I'd like to thank Hao Chuan Chen. Some of you know him, uh, he was here originally for six months, <laughs> and then because of COVID for a year. <laughs> He's a, he's a fantastic guy, and I and I uh, I hope that he can he can join uh, come back to Urbana. I, <laughs> I mean, he had when he speaks about Urbana, he, he he's always it. raving about his, uh, his experience here in uh, in China. Can really, mm -hmm. and my partner in crime, Benoit Roux, uh, also my colleagues in Paris, Tony Luria, Carol Stoltz. In a PhD student, is Tony and Paraskevi, who is at Sanofi, uh, Zi Wei, um, and Andrew Ferguson for uh, exciting discussions, and you for being a such a wonderful author. Okay, so so when can we apply this, or is there a hope to apply this to transport labs? <laughs> <laughs> This is um, actually, I, I don't want to uh, relinquish uh, 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 how to one before he actually tries. Um, and this is something we could work on together because this is our famous AAC. And, and AAC is uh, essentially a two state problem, it's actually a three state. As we discovered it because there is the so for those who are not familiar with the AAC, AAC is the ADP ADP carrier, which you find in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is responsible, which lies in the vicinity of the ATP synthase, and which is responsible for the import export of ADP and ATP. And it works with a stoichiometry of one to one. So any so it, it transports ADP towards the matrix, where ADP will be transformed by the ATP synthase into ATP, and then the transporter goes from this confirmation called the C state into a confirmation now open towards the matrix called the M state, ready to accommodate or to receive ATP to export it towards the intermembrane space. And so we've been competitors, we've been friends, we've been <laughs> on this on this carrier, and um, for a long time, um, the only the C state was known uh, by uh, was discovered in crystallized, not discovered, but crystallized by a collaborator, a friend, and I've been in France. And in 2019, uh, Edmund Kunji at the MRC in Cambridge. Uh, crystallized the M state, so the opposite M state of a different species. Uh, the C state was a bovine uh, heart uh, uh, species, and uh, and uh, and Kunji is a fungal uh, version of the uh, 
of the M state. But I was mentioning there is another state, uh, and that goes back to uh, seminal work by a guy named Klingenberg, uh, way before the structure, and anticipated that to go from C to M uh, with a nuclear guy, it has to go somehow through an occluded form. <laughs> And that occluded form is unlikely to be stable in the absence of a nucleotide because, I mean, apparently the carrier has the ability to go from M to C without anything, mm -hmm. kind of a rare event, biologically speaking, but it still exists. But when the nucleotide comes in, it actually stabilizes the closed form. I mean, we know, we know that there should be a closed form in the mm -hmm. mind. Intuitively, you cannot imagine going through this form. Mm -hmm. That would be physiologically irrelevant. Although, as Emma knows, a guy named Jane Chu oh. published the structure of another mitochondrial carrier called UCP1 oh. in this form, <laughs> Nature, in you know, 2013. Yeah. And that, of course, makes no sense because I mean, it's completely open and what can you do? Gradient. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Kill, kill the, the, the proton gradients across the uh, across the membrane. So, um, but we could apply. We could apply. We could featureize. Featureize. We That's could featureize the right? of thing yeah. that have been accumulating the, all the knowledge that has been accumulated. Okay. Yeah, exactly. The polyps. Yeah. The, uh, right. Incidentally, uh, just to finish my uh, mm. my digression on the, on the carrier. Uh, um, it, it stays in the C state by virtue of a network of coplanar mm -hmm. salt bridges yeah. in the bottom of the carrier. And when it goes to the end state, it forms a network of coplanar yeah. salt bridges yeah. at yeah. the mouth with three salt bridges, three salt bridges. So those are like possible features. I see. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have already simulations of the uh, M to C or C to M transition with. Variables, but we see the end state, we see the C state, we see the open state. Unfortunately, not with the right priority, but it works. Okay. It does work. Uh -huh. Yeah. More question? Yeah. Um, thank you again for this impressive area of methods and the refinements. It's always exciting to see it from you from here. Uh, allow me a pedestrian question, please. Uh, so, if you want to sample rare events, of course, you have to pay the price of details. I was wondering if you're not interested in the details of the trajectories of transition for which you have to go through all these hard exercises of suggesting even intuitively guided collective variables and so on. If you're instead interested in the overall rate of transition, and if you were willing to accept not knowing what happens in between, what shortcuts are available to free energy landscape uh, calculations? Um, in a sense, this is what we do when we, um, like for permeation events, which are super rare events, when we uh, just take a Brownian dynamics. Uh, um, description of the process of uh, and discretize it. Uh, Maybe it's purely guided, but I have in mind this long time scale properties should be guided by lowest modes of a time evolution operator, which perhaps can be extracted without knowing the individual trajectories mm -hmm. that get you there. Is there such a shortcut available for a free energy uh, framework? Or is this a this is, this is the kind of goose chase that we're doing uh, when we are trying to see these methodologies like, like data driven CV discovery is first and foremost a dimensionality reduction problem. Mm -hmm. We're trying to extract the needle from the haystack, trying to find the collective variable that is able to capture this rare transition that you're talking about, that equilibrium MD is not able to see, that biased MD with the wrong CV is not able to see. 
And, and, and the hope is that the CV that we are discovering is also representative of, or let's say, reflects the correct dynamics. That's, that's, that's how we see scriptization that you're talking about. And that's that's good. But as as you saw in the in the, in the example that I showed with the triadony, um, the, 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 you have a variety of pathways. So when we do like string method and and, and we convince ourselves and and, and now I mean I, I had not too long ago a discussion with Mahmoud mm -hmm. about that and first. You have applied this methodology. So, for those who are not familiar, that's uh, one way to approach this complex transition. It's this beautiful paper that came out. We had our own on, uh, on uh, ATPAs, on V1, the name of ATPAs, where essentially what you do is uh, um, you're not able to see what's going on because there are too many atoms moving at the same time. And and, and you're not able to see this uh, the, the, the confirmation of visual and confirmation of transition in a classical equilibrium like, and simulation. So, what you decide to do is making some very drastic choices. What are the groups of atoms that are involved in the transition? And then, by virtue of having the different states from PDD, crystal structures. We do a string calculation. And the hope is that you get physically meaningful pathway. For a long time, we thought that this pathway is kind of unique mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is like a minimum fringe pathway, and we're good to go. And then we can calculate the fringe along this pathway. But what we see on something as simple as triality, it doesn't work like this. You go from A to B in a tube. Mm -hmm. And this tube is populated by reactive trajectories. But in among these many reactive trajectories, only one is actually the most probable transition pathway, the one that corresponds to the physics, to the underlying physics of, of the process of the transition. And, um, and what we should do, in fact, is we can afford that. I mean, we're talking about like. I don't know, I don't remember about your ABC transporter, but, yeah. but V1, the V1 ATPA is spring calculation in a space of dimensionality of 1200 was 65 microseconds long for 400,000 atoms. It was like a year long calculation on blue waters. It's not something that you can repeat like 10 times just to make sure that, oh yeah, this is the correct spring. So, and that, that points also to the idea that maybe there's something better to do. Than, uh, and that's where, that's where uh, AI, uh, data-driven uh, uh, CV discovery can help. What I said when I made this analogy with Westworld, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I don't think that you can say, well, okay, I'm going to take ATPAs and, and redo the, the, the thing and, and learn the variable. First, you have to realize that uh, this is very slow. Mm -hmm. And the connection between, um, um, well, the, um, it's kind of rooted in cold wars being slow. And, and the fact that we're using like, these custom functions and uh, and uh, it's really slowing down the, the whole process. I'm not even talking about yes. the Python, uh, which is done externally, uh, but um, uh, there is like a lot of room for improvement in terms of uh, speeding up the, uh, the calculation is called box. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Question. Not maybe a basic question, but uh, are there any metrics you can use to doing some of the hyperparameters, so the number of layers or the uh, inference you just did? Apart from trial and error, 
I mean, we, we just really like this morning that uh, we're trying our different peptide and, uh, and the lactone, just the lactone. It's, uh, we, the one that we have chosen was not ideal and it didn't give us the correct uh, intermediate states and uh, and and so we are retrying and now it works better and but I think that we are still too early in the process to say I'm gonna I'm gonna quote my my my, my friend and colleague Tony Lelier the mathematician say like when things don't work we don't understand why when things work we don't understand why. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's at that point that, um, well, there are a few things that we understand, but like um, why, for some cases, ReLU would work better than, than high quality tangents. I don't know. Uh, why three hidden layers would work better than four hidden layers. I don't know. Uh, there are all these things that I cannot really explain because. You're talking about hyperparameters. I mean, we cannot, and because of the cost of these calculations, we cannot change them and, and do like a plural sampling of all the combinations. So we have to make our choices. And, and maybe we've been unlucky in our choices, but um, uh, we have, I have to confess, we have very little grasp of uh, uh, how to improve except by, by trial and error. I'm sorry, that's, that's just the awful truth. <laughs> okay, let's thank Chris.